out. Good morning and welcome to Church at Home. It is great to be back together with you today. I've been waiting all week. It's so hard to believe that it's already been a week since our Christmas Eve services. So we had such a great time. Hopefully you were able to join us either in person or online for our Christmas Eve services. If you missed it, uh, you can head out to YouTube, youtube.com slash Jersey Church, and we've got our chapel and our central venue Christmas services loaded up there. Uh, Time well spent watching that. Uh, But here we are today, last day of 2023. That is so hard to believe. We're sitting really at the dawn of a brand new year. And so we're thankful to be sitting here with you today. Thanks for being with us. Uh, It's going to be a great morning of worship. I was listening to the band warm up just a little bit ago. Already heard Luke. uh, Luke is preaching today. Luke preached in our chapel service. Uh, Such a great message. And so I know you're going to be encouraged and challenged by it this morning. So looking forward to a really great morning of worship. And so uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get started with the band this morning. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time of worship. We uh, pray more than anything that it would be pleasing to you today. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, Jersey Church. Thank you all so much for joining us. Last service of the new year. Why don't we all go ahead and stand up as we worship?
And you freed every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great. You all can have a seat this morning. Welcome to Jersey. It is so good to be together with you today. Uh, it's so hard to believe that we are sitting the last day of 2023. It's also hard to believe it's been a week since our Christmas Eve services. Uh, but we are so excited to be sitting here together with you, ready to worship this morning as we really kind of sit at the dawn of a brand new year. If you're new with us, we just want to extend an especially warm welcome to you. Say thank you so much for being here. It does mean a lot to have you here with us this morning. If you'd like to get to know us a little bit better, we would love to get to know you. Uh, you can send us a text message. Uh, that number, if you're online, is going to pop up on the bottom of your screen. If you're here in the room, you can text us, but really the best way is to head over to our new uh, our um, welcome area. Uh, and just say hi. And if you have any questions, we would love to help answer any of those questions that you have today. And so again, we just want to say welcome. Handful of things to mention today. All of these are really next steps. And so the first one we've got coming up, Pizza with the Pastors. If you are newer at Jersey, maybe you've been here for a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, and you've been just checking things out, but you're kind of at the point now where you would say, yeah, I want to know just a little bit more. And so this is a great opportunity for you to show up, have free, a free lunch with some of our staff. You get to meet us. We get to share with you a little bit about Jersey, answer any questions you might have. And so we'll spend about an hour or so together. And so just a great time. So that's a great next step if you want to know a little bit more about Jersey. The next week in January, we have our Discover Jersey new member class happening. This is a four-week class. This is really geared for those of you that would say, you know, I've been hanging around here for quite a while now. I really love what's happening with Jersey, what, what this church is doing. I want to be a part of it moving forward. And if that is you, we would love to have you in our new members class in January. All you need to do for either Pizza with the Pastors or the new member class is hop online and register. Or you can head out to the Next Steps area and you can sign up there as well. Last thing I wanna mention, and this is for everybody, we have a new series and grow group study starting on January 14th. Pastor Matt's actually kicking off the series with kind of an introductory message next Sunday. And so this series is called Living Life Upside Down. We are gonna be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And really what we are going to be doing is we're going to try to figure out how do we live differently? How do we live differently in a culture that is drifting further and further away from God seemingly every day? And so it's going to be a great series as we spend six, seven weeks together, Sermon on the Mount, How to Live Life Upside Down. Hopefully you'll join us for that series. If you want to get connected in a grow group, I want to encourage you, this is going to be one of those studies. It's just going to be better if you can get together with a group of people and really dive into what God's Word is saying as we make our way through this series and study. If you want to connect with a group, I would encourage you, you can, you can either head out to jerseychurch.org slash upside down, or you can head right out to the Next Steps area. Let them know you want to connect with a grow group for this study, and they will help you do that. Well, let's go ahead and stand today. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to continue singing as our worship continues this morning. Father, we do thank you for today. Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Father, as we think about the next steps that we can take in our, in our walk with you, there, there is a next step all the time. We're, we're never at the finish line. And so, Father, there is always a next step for us to take. And so I pray that maybe in 2024, maybe as we think about that, maybe we think about that next step that you are calling us to, 
Father, help us to take it. In Jesus' name, amen.
fear will never conquer. I belong to Jesus. been here we just sang Emmanuel God with us and the truth is that we can sing that year round because we know that you are with us you are for us so as we enter into this new year and wrap up our praise for 2023 we just do it with a joy with a bigness we sing this death could not hold
he's done something today, isn't it? Father, we just sing these things and I can't help, help but feel the weight of gratitude, the gravity of what we've come from this year, the weight of what we see, it's real. And I feel you wanting to be present, wanting to be with us, wanting to walk with us through that. And it just doesn't go away. So if there's one message we need today, coming out of 2023, going into 2024, is that you are still the same God who was with us. And you still wanna be the God who is for us and with us next year. So God, we need you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bonja and the band. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful God we serve. Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Luke Reininger, and I'm very grateful to Pastor Matt for allowing me this opportunity and, and sharing this pulpit so that we can dive into God's word together this morning. Now, prayerfully, here in about 30 minutes, he won't regret that decision, so we'll see. Now, um, our text today is going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're going to be starting in verse 9. So as you make your way to Romans chapter 12, verse 9, I have a question for you. Um, how many of you in here have ever been on a blind date? This is getting awkward. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so five people. So everybody else, this is irrelevant for you, so that's good. Um, now, if you ever do go on a blind date, don't do what this young man did. So there was a college kid. He went up to his roommate, and he said, hey, I just wanted you to know that I'm going to set you up on a blind date tomorrow with my cousin. And so the roommate was like, whoa, hold on. I don't, I don't do blind dates. And he goes, no, listen, trust me. You're really going to like my cousin. She's smart. She's funny. She's very pretty. You're going to love her. But just in case you need a backup plan, just do what I do when I go on blind dates. See, when I go on a blind date, uh, when I get to where I'm meeting the girl, I send a text to a friend to call me in three minutes. And when, that way, when I see the girl, if she's not very attractive, and I don't really want to continue this date and waste the next couple of hours pretending like I want to be there, then when my friend calls, I'll answer my phone and I'll say something like, oh no, are you serious? I can't believe it. I'm so sorry, I'm on my way. And then that way, when I hang up the phone, I can just tell the girl, like, you know, I'm so sorry, there was an emergency, I just have to go. And then, you know, now I'm free for the rest of the evening. So the roommate says, okay, you know, I'll, I'll go on a date with your cousin. So the next day, she pulls, or he pulls up to her apartment, and he texts his friend when he parks the car and says, hey, I just got here, can you call me in three minutes? So he knocks on the door, and man, when this young lady opens the door, it was love at first sight. I mean, she was absolutely gorgeous. He couldn't believe someone so beautiful even came from the same family tree of his roommate. And so naturally, when they were talking and getting to know each other a little bit before leaving, his phone rings, and he decides not to answer it because he just can't wait to continue this date. He turns to say, hey, are you ready to go? When she answers her phone and she says, oh, no, are you serious? I can't believe it. I'll be right there. And so she hangs up the phone and says to this roommate, hey, I'm so sorry there's an emergency and I just have to go. And he slammed that door right in his face. And there was never an opportunity for a first or a second date. Now you may be wondering, Luke, is that a true story? Maybe. <laughs> you may also be wondering, Luke, was that story about you? Maybe. <laughs> That's not the point of why we're here, okay? The point is, in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, which is our text, we start with this concept of love, and the rest of the verses are to be understood with this true biblical love in mind. So if you would, please join me in reading Romans chapter 12. We'll be starting in verse 9. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence and zeal, but be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen. Now, our passage this morning starts with a command about love, right? In fact, Scripture gives 30 commands right here in our passage from verses 9 to the end of the chapter 21. Now, the good news is that for the most part, these commands are pretty easy to understand. Uh, But the bad news is we don't have the time to dive into all 30 commands this morning. So for those of you who like to take notes, I'm going to give you a brief outline. So we're going to have three points. The first point is, what is true love? Our second point is going to be true love is not hypocritical. And then our third point is going to be that true love is given to others. And we're going to talk about those inside and outside the body of Christ. So our first point, what is true love? Our second point, true love is not hypocritical. Those are coming from verse 9. And our third point, the rest of the passage, is true love is given to others. So first point, what is true love? This comes from verse 9, which says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Now, this word for love is used in many different ways in our culture, isn't it? Right? We say things like, I love my wife. I love pizza. I love the color blue. I love the beach. Right? We use all these different words to describe love. But when I say that I love my wife, you all know that the love that I have my wife, or love I have for my wife, is not the same as the way that I love pizza. Right? See, when I say that I love pizza, I don't mean that I care about uh, pizza's well-being. I don't really want a personal relationship with pizza, right? I mean that I prefer pizza more regularly than other types of food. But my love for pizza doesn't really extend beyond the desire to get something. But that is not the same way that I love my wife. Can you imagine if I said to my wife, you know, babe, I want you to know that my love for you is kind of like how I love pizza. See, I prefer you more than most women. And I like spending time with you when I want something, you know. But I don't really want a personal relationship with you, and I don't really care about your well-being. Yeah, if I said that to my wife, I would wake up dead. (laughs) Yeah. So when a person says that they love you, how do they love you? Do they mean that they love you in a way that they desire a more in-depth, meaningful relationship with you? Or do they mean in the pizza love kind of way where really in all reality they just want to get something from you. Now if you didn't know this, I'm a high school teacher and so even though we're on Christmas break, I'm going to give you guys a little pop quiz this morning. Now how many of you just got sweaty palms from hearing pop quiz? Test anxiety, it's a real thing. All right, now I promise it's not graded, so here's your pop quiz. It's going to be two questions. First, what is the Greek word for love that we most often think of God's love for us? Agape. Yes, see, that wasn't very hard. You guys, that was great. I mean, not as good as 8 o'clock, I'm just saying. But, yes, agape love. All right, one down, one to go. When the Bible says in verse 9 in our text to let love be without hypocrisy, what Greek word do you think is used for love there? And I'm going to give you a hint. You ready? It's the same word you just said. Agape. Good. You nailed it. All right, no more pop quizzes. All of, you, uh, all of you with test anxiety, you can relax now. Now, the real question for us this morning is, why does it matter that the word in our text is agape for love and not one of the other biblical words for love? See, we normally think of agape love as being God's love for us, and I think that is a right idea to kind of have in our noggins. But here in this passage, Paul uses agape not to describe God's love for us, but to describe how we, his children, ought to love one another. Now, if you would, look with me in verse 2, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think about that for a moment. We should be so continuously transformed by God's Holy Spirit uh, within us and by his display of perfect love for us on the cross that we love one another with that same kind of agape love that he has for us. And because God's love for us is infinite, that love should overflow from us to others who are made in his his image. And that's going to be point three, so stay tuned. So even though the word love isn't explicitly stated in every verse after verse nine, 
I believe this agape love is kind of the foundation, the building block for the rest of the verses in this passage. Now, how do we know what the biblical definition for love is? It might not be a surprise to you, but the first time the word love appears in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. And so if we can rightly understand kind of the nuances there, then maybe that can help give us a better definition. The Hebrew word for love in Genesis kind of means this act of doing, and it's kind of connected with this idea of action and obedience. It also carries this idea of giving. So the root word means to give. So if we combine all that together, and we get this biblical definition of love, we could say that something like this, that love wants more to give than to get. So we could say true biblical love wants more to give than it does to get. Jesus also using this word agape, you don't have to turn there, but I think it'll be on the screen. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus used this word agape to teach his disciples how they should love one another. Why? So that the world would know who were his disciples by the love that they would show to one another. So our only hope in understanding and keeping the 30 commands from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through the end of the chapter is through the transforming power of the gospel and by allowing God's agape-like love to instill in us a greater desire to give to others rather than to get. Now, there's something else in the second half of verse 9. If you look, Scripture says that true love detests evil and clings to what is good. So what does that mean? The word detest actually literally means to hate evil exceedingly. And clinging to what is good is kind of like the idea of cleaving as in a marriage. So cleaving together as in a marriage. That sounds strange at first, doesn't it? That we have in the same verse agape love and hate in the same verse verse, but to love with an agape-like love, the church must hate what God hates, and it must love what God loves. See, the more we grow in our love for Jesus Christ, the more that we will grow in our hatred of sin. The more that we are transformed into the image of our Savior, then the more that we detest not only our own sin, but the sin in the world. I believe that one of the greatest weaknesses in the American church is not necessarily intolerance, but actually tolerance for the things that are evil. One evil amongst many that God detests is sexual immorality. And man, we are just bombarded with that in our culture, aren't we? It's normalized, not only in our music, but on social media and on television. Even the shows geared toward little children have these unbiblical principles kind of snuck in there. From my own experience when the, move, uh, when the movie Fifty Shades of Grey came out, my own boss said that my wife and I had to watch that movie because, man, it would just radically change our marriage. Now, I didn't say this then, but bringing sexual immorality into a relationship does not provide strength. Only a relationship with the God who created marriage in the first place can fully satisfy every aspect of our lives. Now, I know that maybe Fifty Shades of Grey is kind of this extreme example, but it begs the question, how much sexual immorality is okay in the eyes of God? You know, is it okay if we just have like a little bit here and there? But I pray that we would cry out like the psalmist to turn our eyes from looking at what is worthless and to give us life in his ways. See, there's this constant pressure to conform to this world, but we must continuously be transformed into the image of Christ and guard our hearts, minds, and even our homes against all that which God hates. So to recap, our first point, what is true love? True love wants more to give than it does to get. And true love is so transformed by the gospel through God's spirit that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. But there's something else in verse 9 that true love is not, and that's our second point. True love is not hypocritical. So how do we understand verse 9 when it says that we should love one another without hypocrisy? Because when I think of a hypocrite, I think of someone saying something like, never drink straight from the container. And then you catch them later at night like a deer in headlights drinking straight from the carton of milk. You're like, dude, that is hypocritical, right, in a sense, but... What is the first century meaning of this word for hypocrite? 
It carries this idea of an actor on stage or someone wearing a mask. See, back then, actors would hold up masks that would display various emotions no matter how the person behind the mask was actually feeling. So in order to love without hypocrisy, we have to love others in a genuine way. It's love without a mask. See, the family of God should never become a stage that is filled with fake love. Now, why did Jesus then call some of the religious leaders hypocrites in his time? See, the thing is, is many times the religious leaders were actually doing the right things, but they were doing them with the wrong heart. This means that we can serve, we can give, read, pray, we can do all of these good things, but if we do them with the wrong heart, then they are nothing in the eyes of God. The religious leaders in Jesus' day were performing their religious duties as with a mask. They thought they knew God, but their hearts were far from him. One, com uh, one commentator described hypocrisy this way. He said, hypocrisy is to do the devil's work in God's uniform. Man, that just kind of packs a punch, doesn't it? Hypocrisy is to do the devil's work in God's uniform. It means that, that we don't compliment someone to their face when, when we don't actually mean what we're saying, right? We call that flattery. Nor do we talk poorly about them behind their backs, which is what we would call gossiping. But man, it's easy to fall in that trap of gossip, isn't it? Whether you're at the office, maybe with your friends, or even at home. But see, just because talking about other people is easy to do, believers must never partake in gossip. And, and when we do, because for most of us, it's inevitable from time to time, we must take off the mask, repent, confess, and seek forgiveness for the purpose of unity within the body of Christ, for the purpose of growing in Christ's likeness, and for the purpose of displaying, of showing that true love for one another as without a mask. Now, that might sound really good, like, hey, don't participate in gossip. Go. But how can we stop ourselves? If that's something we struggle with, I have four, <laughs> I, did, I teach math, so that was hard. Uh, I have four, not three, four quick suggestions. First, try to be aware of the conversations that are already occurring, right? Are they leading toward a way that speaks about somebody negatively? And just try to catch yourself being aware in the beginning. Second, maybe we can try to ask ourselves something like this. Is what I'm about to say edifying to those who will hear it? Or does what I'm about to say build up the person that I'm speaking about? Third, maybe when we're in a conversation and we feel it's going in a gossipy direction, I don't even know if that's a word, but it is now, maybe we can try to politely change the subject. We can say something like, you know, I, I'm not sure I feel comfortable talking about that person when they're not here. It's kind, it's gentle, trying to change the subject. Finally, maybe we can memorize one of many verses about the tongue, but there is one, James 3, 9, for us this morning, Something like James 3.9 says, With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. See, brothers and sisters, we are commanded to love one another without a mask. And gossiping has no place coming from the mouths of the family of God. So to conclude our second point, loving without hypocrisy means that true agape-like love will always be as without a mask. It will be in line with God's truth and it will seek the spiritual good of others. The rest of Romans chapter 12 tells us how that believers are to demonstrate this true love, not only for those uh, inside the church, for one another, but also those outside of the body of Christ. And this is gonna be our third and final point. That true love is given to others. So part of giving true love to others kind of comes from verse 10. So if you look there, we're told to outdo one another in showing honor. Also in verse 11, we're told to be fervent in the spirit, which literally means to be boiling over, to be set aflame by the spirit of God. Now this word outdo is very interesting. It actually only occurs this one time here in the New Testament. And it doesn't suggest this kind of like conceited one-upmanship, but actually exemplary behavior. It carries the idea of honoring one another so much through service 
that you actually lead others to model your own behavior. And we can only do this rightly when we are filled with God's spirit. See, honoring one another means that you serve somebody as though they deserve to be served. You count their needs greater than your own. Think about how radical this would have been in the first century, though. So that means masters were called to honor their slaves. It also means that men were called to honor women. And this was a radical shift in the minds living in that time period, in that culture, but they were called to love in the same way that Jesus loved them. I think a great example of Jesus modeling this, kind of taking the lead and honoring one another, is when he washed the disciples' feet. And yes, the king of glory even took the lead in washing the feet of Jesus. And he did so even though he knew, I said Jesus twice, Jesus, Judas, washed Judas' feet. But he did that even though he knew that Judas was going to betray him very, very soon. So the question I have for us this morning is, man, is there anybody in here that maybe you've just lost that passion? You lost that fervency for Christ that you once had. Have you maybe been a Christian for so long that you just kind of find yourself going through the motions? See, if we want to fan that desire in the flame again, if we want to, to be more like Christ, and we have to constantly look for ways to be conformed into his image, we need to be in community. We need to be in God's word. We need to spend time in prayer and not only reading but doing what he commands us to do. If the king and creator of the universe, full of the Holy Spirit, could wash his disciples' nasty, stinking feet, then what is our excuse? What task are we too good for? What task is beneath us? Because remember, Jesus did not come here to get, but he came here to give. And he gave his life for you. And we also are here to give to others and not just to get. Verse 13 tells us another way that we are to love one another, and that is to share with the saints in their needs and to pursue hospitality. This carries the idea of having an open hand, right? When we see someone in need, especially those in the body of Christ, and we help them in their need, we're displaying this agape-like love for our brothers and sisters. Now, what about hospitality? So the thing is, is being hospitable doesn't mean that you have like the perfect house, the perfect yard, the perfect food, right? You don't need some special gift of hospitality because remember, in this section, these are commands for every Christian. We are commanded to be hospitable. So we need to get to know others in this church, in our community. Listen to them as, as you ask questions to try to get them to know them better. Invite them over for coffee or something similar. It doesn't have to be this grand meal or this grand experience, but it does take time. And many times, time matters way more for most people than having this fancy meal. So as we spend time in community with one another, then we can more easily keep verses 15's commands to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. See, true love enters into the emotions of others. But man, can I be honest with you? I find it so much harder to rejoice with others who are rejoicing because of pride, just kind of sneaks in, than I do to weep with those who are weeping. Is anyone else like that or just like the five people that raise their hand about blind dates? Yeah. <clears throat> but man, it's like, it's like you want to rejoice with others who are rejoicing, but sometimes these prideful thoughts creep in. Right? Like, man, why haven't I gotten that promotion? Or... Why don't I have some random rich uncle that left me his whole estate? Or man, why didn't I get into that college? I'm way smarter than they are. Why are all my friends getting engaged and I'm still alone? See, it's easy to let those thoughts kind of creep in, right? But we must fight to keep that pride out. Pride not only is addressed in our text in verse 16, but also pretty much everywhere else in the Bible. And see, if we are to live in harmony with one another, if we are to have unity in the body of Christ, then pride must be crushed with humility. See, pride can't rejoice with others who are rejoicing, but humility can rejoice. And it can show agape-like love as without a mask. 
Pride may be the greatest barrier to unity. Think about most broken marriages or split churches or friendships that crumbled. Somewhere along the way, pride ruled the terrain. But here's the thing, a prideful Christian is an oxymoron, which is so great for me to hear. It's a contradiction, right? God's word says in more than one place, but you probably know this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's everywhere. But in order to give true love to those in the body of Christ, we must be zealous for the things of God. Take the lead in honoring one another. Destroy pride and pursue hospitality. Now, how do we show love to others when we're persecuted? So let's quickly look at a few more verses before we close. First, verse 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's an interesting verse because notice how verse 14 is in the same section of our passage talking about how we ought to love one another. So this means that those in the body of Christ, this means we can sometimes expect to be hurt by believers, but you're like, oh no, Christians are perfect. How can this be? But you see, you know, sheep are kind of like docile and kind of dumb, right? But because of pride, sometimes sheep bite. You know, all of us, probably have little sheep bite marks. And maybe some of us are responsible for some sheep bite marks on others. Why? Because we are deeply flawed humans trying to serve a perfectly holy God. Now, how did Jesus respond when his friends abandoned him? And when he was being beaten, mocked, and eventually crucified by those not only that he created, but those that he came to save? Remember that as he was about to give up his life, he begged for the forgiveness of those that were doing this to him. And we also are called to forgive one another with the same heart. And the thief on the cross, rather than Jesus telling him how much he deserved what he was getting, Jesus promised to take him to paradise that very day. So I have to ask, what is our excuse for responding harshly or with unkind words to others when they bite. Only that our, our fleshly nature is still at war with this new nature that we have in Christ. So when we respond wrongly, and, and, and we will, we must repent and seek forgiveness. A wise person once said about reconciling conflict that the more spiritually mature person will be the first to seek reconciliation. I don't like that quote. That's terrible. I'd rather you come to me. I don't want to go to you. But it takes a lot of humility, especially when we're the one kind of in the wrong, or even if we don't feel like we're the one in the wrong. But see, that just kind of shines some areas in my own life where I have a lot of need for growth, and, and maybe some of you can relate to that here as well. Quickly, let's look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, To be patient in affliction, which was a teaching that Paul gave to every church. Affliction is the backdrop of Christian life. And if you haven't experienced any affliction yet, you will. It's, it's coming. But here's what I want you to take away. Satan's design for affliction is to destroy our faith. But God's di uh, design for affliction is to refine our faith. Satan's design is to destroy our faith, but God's design is to refine our faith. See, Jesus doesn't just abandon you in trials. He is walking with you. And imagine if we, if we changed our mindset to look at affliction for the sake of Christ as a privilege instead of a punishment. Now, unfortunately, pride also gets in the way of loving those outside of the body of Christ, especially in those times of affliction. Verse 17 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Now, those of you that know me, this is a service I attend. Um, this is going to be a shocking statement to you. Are you ready? I'm not, like, when you look at me, I'm not really what you would call, like, an alpha male. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> see, when it comes to fight or flight, I'm more of a flight kind of guy. I just hope I can run faster, you know? I recently heard that there was actually a third category now called fawn, but that sounded too much like something Pastor John would hunt. So <laughs> I'm leaving that out. We're not going there. Anyway, some of you are fighters, right? 
you enjoy conflict. You love the debate. I mean, you're quick with it. Well, sometimes you have a sharp tongue. And sometimes that can be used on social media or in your home with your spouse or children or grandchildren. And maybe sometimes it's used with those inside and outside of the church. But here's the thing, an evil response to another, whether inside or outside the body of Christ, is never permissible by Jesus in the Christian walk. We are actually called to pray for those who persecute us. We ought to pray for their salvation and also for our own hearts to be softened toward them. Our conduct should be such that no one looking in can say that we acted dishonorably. So, here's what I want you to take away. Never let the inability to live at peace with someone else be because you didn't genuinely try to live at peace with them. So what can we do? What can we do with this passage? As Banja and the band kind of comes up and gets ready, and as we enter the new year tomorrow, let us focus on and be intentional about just one thing, one thing that stood out to you. Maybe it's about being more hospitable. Maybe it's fleeing from gossip, reconciling a relationship. Maybe it's guarding our sharp tongues. Whatever it may be for you, let us take off our masks and let us put on Christ and love one another with this godly, agape-like love without hypocrisy so that the world would know that we are his disciples by the love that we give to one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this church and for your word. I pray that out of the 30 commands in this passage, that there's at least one that you would just lay on our hearts, that we would seek to become more like you, that we would love you and serve you and serve others in the way that you've commanded us. As we go throughout the new year, I pray that you would radically change our lives to be conformed into your image. Thank you for who you are and all you've done. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, I mean, as you listen to that message on true love and just all the different aspects of it along the way, and then how Luke ended that really just even in his prayer. I mean, how, how we can become more and more like Jesus every single day. Wow. What, what if that was our heartbeat as we walked into 2024 tomorrow? We wake up. That is our heartbeat. That is what we desire. That's what we're after, to look like Jesus, to reflect him more and more every single day. Uh, wow. I, kn I know that for me, that makes me excited to think about that, especially sitting here right at the dawn of a brand new year. Let that be our heartbeat this year, to reflect Jesus more and more every single day. If you're watching today and you would say, Brian, I, I just need to talk with some people. I, ne I need to maybe just share a prayer request. I just need you guys just to pray for me. We would love the opportunity to be able to do that. I just want to encourage you, send us an email, send us a text message. We will make sure that we respond back to you. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you or pray for you. Well, I want to invite you back next week. Remember, we're starting a, a brand new series on the 14th, but Pastor Matt is kicking things off with kind of a teeing up message, an introductory message into this series and study that we are going to be doing, Living Life Upside Down. So I want to invite you back here starting January 7th. We're officially kicking it off January 14th, and then we'll be in that series and study for about six weeks together. So I want to invite you back next week. Join us there. Happy New Year, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday.